there was no project during my first decade at Disney about which I felt more passionate than Disney's America, and none that ran up against fiercer resistance. Michael Eisner, CEO and Chairman of the Walt Disney Company. Walt Disney had many titles throughout his career. He was an artist, an innovator, an entrepreneur, a voice actor, and a television host. But the title that he was most proud seemed to be Patriot. Walt Disney's fascination and love for his country found its way into many of his films and projects. In his own words, Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America. Main Street USA and Frontierland were meant to capitalize on Walt's personal nostalgia for Americana, and he would attempt to implement more aspects of United States history throughout his theme parks. As early as 1956, one year after Disneyland opened, Disney had conceived an annex to Disneyland's Main Street USA called Liberty Street. This would have been a recreation of Colonial Boston in the year 1775. Due to limited technology and the expense of 1959 Tomorrowland expansion, this never came to fruition. Around 1963, Disney would begin development on a second theme park to be located in St. Louis, Missouri named Riverfront Square. This was to include many elements from Disneyland with a greater emphasis on American history and culture. Disney would abandon this project after a series of issues with the city of St. Louis and to focus on his Florida project. Again tapping into his love of U.S. history, Disney developed an animatronic version of President Abraham Lincoln for the 1964 World's Fair. This technology and the original concept for Liberty Street would be combined to create Liberty Square at Walt Disney World, and its signature attraction, the Hall of Presidents. By the time Walt Disney passed away in 1966, the company he created had almost a synergetic relationship with America. The United States influenced Disney, and Disney influenced the United States. However, neither institution was without its issues. Both the United States of America and the Walt Disney Company could be considered empires in their own right. And 25 years later in 1991, both were on the move. The United States was sending its troops to Iraq, while the Walt Disney Company was invading Virginia. the summer of 1991. The Walt Disney Company's newest park, Euro Disneyland, was to open in France the following year, but it was behind schedule and over budget. Frustrated with the construction process, CEO and chairman of the company Michael Eisner spoke to the company's president, Frank Wells, about the potential for a smaller Disney theme park, one that would avoid many of the issues they had been facing with Euro Disney. Demand for the Disney brand was the highest it had been in decades since Eisner, Wells, and the president of Walt Disney Studios, Jeffrey Katzenberg, had saved the company from financial ruin. The brand was about to grow even stronger, with the release of Beauty and the Beast that winter, Aladdin in 1992, and The Lion King in 1994. At the suggestion of the head of Disney Parks, Dick Nunes, Eisner and Wells traveled to Colonial Williamsburg. Nunes thought the area would be perfect for a smaller Disney theme park with an emphasis on American history. The idea had been at the forefront of everyone's thoughts, as early developments on an animated Pocahontas film had just begun. While Eisner and Wells liked the idea, it was clear that Williamsburg would not work for a location. The area did not have the tourists necessary to justify the investment, and it was three hours from the much more lucrative Washington, D.C. While not sold on Williamsburg, the idea alone had captured Eisner's attention. Our visit did convince me that a park based on historical and patriotic themes could succeed, if we found the right place for it. Michael Eisner. That idea turned into a plan, and that plan would turn into an invasion. Throughout the years, the reaction to the march of Disney's empire by locals had varied. They were mostly celebrated when they arrived in Orlando, and the people of Tokyo cheered them as they entered Japan. On the other hand, their invasion of France was met with strong opposition, and they had poor relations with the people of Anaheim. Through these experiences, the Walt Disney Company believed they knew how to properly execute an invasion. The first phase of their plan required complete secrecy. In the fall of 1992, Michael Eisner ordered the head of the Disney Design and Development Company, Peter Rummel, to scout locations for the park. He came back with the obvious answer, Washington, D.C. It's no contest. It has a huge tourist population, and they're just the kind of people who would be interested in a historical theme park. Peter Rummel, 
president of Disney Design and Development Company. A few months later in January of 1993, Eisner ordered Imagineer Bob Wise to lead the creative development of the park. At the same time, Rummel attempted to narrow the park's location and purchase the land. By the spring, a location had been found. Just outside of Haymarket, Virginia and Prince William County, the 3,000 acres of land was only 35 miles west of Washington, D.C. 2,300 of the 3,000 acres were owned by Exxon, who had done nothing with the farmland since buying it during a real estate boom. Disney purchased an option to buy from Exxon and began acquiring the remaining 500 to 600 acres of surrounding land, all done with the utmost secrecy. They had experience with this, as Disney had used shell companies to purchase the 30,000 acres of land in Orlando in the mid-60s. It was all a sneak attack, and as they would later learn, a fatal mistake. Around this time, Eisner hired Mark Pacala, who at the time was heading the development of the Disney Vacation Club, to be the general manager of the park, which had been given the name Disney's America. Imagineering had been working for months to create the concept for the park, and by late 1993, they had done just that. The park that the Imagineers envisioned had nine lands, referred to as territories. The first land guests would enter would be Crossroads, USA. Set in the mid-1800s, this land, according to the park's promotional brochure, was to be a spirited portrait of mid-19th century commerce. Crossroads, USA is the hub of Disney's America, launching guests on an unforgettable journey through the vivid tapestry of American history. A train trestle marked the entrance to the land, with two antique steam trains traveling the park's perimeter. River transportation would have also been available from this area, likely taking guests toward the Enterprise Territory. This area, set during the Industrial Revolution, was described as a factory town showcasing inventions and innovations spawned by the integrity and can-do spirit that catapulted America to the forefront of the industry. Attractions would have included a part roller coaster, part museum called the Industrial Revolution, which would twist and turn guests through the history of industry and even get them up close to a dangerous vat of molten metal. There would also be another ride or walkthrough exhibit focusing on the creation of products or the evolution of manufacturing and an attraction called Industry Today, where guests can navigate remote-controlled shipping vessels on a small lagoon. Next to the town of Enterprise would be an area called We the People, set in the same era. The park's brochure read, Framed by a building resembling Ellis Island, We the People recognizes the courage and triumph of our immigrant heritage, from the earliest native settlers to the latest political refugees. This would have included a replication of New York City's Ellis Island building, which would house a show that would explain the immigrant experience in the early 20th century and the impact it had on the United States. This area would also serve as a mini-world showcase, with a variety of eateries and music from different cultures that immigrated to the U.S. Set in the 1930s and 40s, the park's fourth territory would be Victory Field. Themed after an aircraft hangar and landing strip, Victory Field would have allowed guests to parachute from a plane or operate tanks and weapons in combat, and experience firsthand what America's soldiers have faced in defense of freedom. The main attractions of Victory Field would be motion simulators or virtual reality attractions, simulating flying World War II planes and tanks. This area would have also been a stop for the park's railroad. Next was the State Fair, also set during the 1930s and 40s. According to the brochure, State Fair celebrates small-town America at play with a nostalgic recreation of such popular rides as a 60-foot Ferris wheel and a classic wooden roller coaster, as well as a tribute to the country's favorite pastime, baseball. Amid a backdrop of rolling cornfields, fans may have a hot dog and take a seat in an authentic, old-fashioned ballpark and watch America's legendary greats gather for an exhibition all-star competition. Set in the same era as Victory Field and State Fair, the park's sixth territory was Family Farm. The description read, Offering a cornucopia of pastoral delights and insight into their production, Family Farm pays homage to the working farm, the heart of early American families. This area would have featured farm exhibits such as animal handling and food productions, a country wedding, barn dance, and food buffet, and a stop for the park's railroad. The Civil War Fort, set between 1850 and 1870, was described as emblematic of our nation's greatest crisis. The Civil War Fort allows guests to experience the reality of a soldier's daily life. This would have included a Circle Vision 360 film that would have put guests in the middle of Civil War battles, outdoor reenactments, and the perfect view of Freedom Bay, the park's main body of water that would be home to a nightly reenactment battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack. This would serve as the park's nightly fireworks show. Harkening back to Disneyland's Indian Village, Disney's America would feature a territory called Native America. Set between 1600 and 1810, Native America explores the life of America's first inhabitants, their accord with the environment, and the timeless works of art they created long before European colonization. This area would have included a recreation of an Indian village, and a river raft ride called the Lewis and Clark River Expedition, which spawned from an original idea from the aforementioned never-built Riverfront Square Park. Finally, President Square, set between 1750 and 1800, was the park's final land. 
From the struggle of the colonists and the War of Independence to the formation of the United States and its government, President Square celebrates the birth of democracy and the patriots who fought to preserve it. The attractions would have been a successor, clone, or relocation of the Magic Kingdom's Hall of Presidents, and a large outdoor amphitheater for shows and performances. Outside of the theme park, Disney also wanted to set up television space to broadcast presidential debates and other events. Of course, Disney wanted guests to be able to stay on property, and there were space allotted for hotels near the entrance, as well as deluxe suites scattered throughout the park, where guests could actually stay within Disney's America overnight. In total, there would be 2,281 houses, 1,340 hotel rooms, a campsite, a shopping district, and two golf courses. The park itself also left a large amount of green space, especially surrounding Freedom Bay. Disney's America was ambitious in its theming, but reserved in its budget. The resort would be completed for just $650 million, around half of Euro Disney's original construction budget. It would only take about 10% of the 3,000 acres Disney had acquired, with plenty of room for expansion should the resort be successful. Research showed that Disney could pull from Washington, D.C.'s 13 million domestic tourists, and the company expected to see 30,000 guests a day during peak season. The park would have to close for two or three months during the winter, so Disney expected around 5 to 6 million guests per year. Their calculations projected that $48 million would be added to Virginia's economy as a direct result of the park, and 19,000 jobs would be created in the park and surrounding area. Disney's America was slated to open in 1998, and Eisner had become invested in the park's development, making it his main focus and newest pet project. While Disney was coming to grips with the massive failure of Euro Disneyland, they were still comfortable with moving forward on Disney's America. They did not foresee the war that their invasion would bring. In early November 1993, Eisner called Virginia Governor-elect George Allen to brief him on the plans for the park. By pure coincidence, Allen was at Walt Disney World at the time, and after hearing the plans for Disney's America, he gave a resounding yes. Disney had found their greatest ally in the governor, whose first term started that January. The media had been catching on to Disney's plans over the course of a few months, but the call to Allen opened the floodgates. Disney announced their plans for the park on November 11, 1993, with a presentation by Wise describing the park in detail. Disney, already worried about negative reaction to a park dedicated to history, ensured the public that they would not be giving the fairy tale version of the American story. They might have overcorrected a bit by explaining that they would have painful, disturbing, and agonizing slavery exhibits and attractions that captured the horrors of war. We want to make you a Civil War soldier. We want to make you feel what it was like to be a slave, or what it was like to escape through the Underground Railroad. Bob Weiss, Imagineer. In hindsight, this was the wrong thing to say. Now that the park had gone public, Disney began flanking every side of development, hiring lobbyists for the local, state, and even federal governments in an attempt to acquire permits and exceptions necessary to build the park. They began to court local and state officials, knowing that they would need to alter zoning ordinances, and most importantly, widen Interstate 66 that guests would use to get to the property. Prince William County, especially the people of Haymarket, were excited at the park's announcement. Haymarket had been hit hard by recession in the early 90s and were hopeful that the park would help them recover. Disney set up an office in the town and made a donation of $1,000 to the town's Lafayette Day celebration. The company also imposed restrictions on themselves, ensuring the people of Prince William County that they would expand the wooded area surrounding the park, restrict the height of the planned buildings and attractions, and ban diesel engines to avoid air pollution. The town's papers rejoiced with headlines reading zippity doo and local businesses created signs saying, We Love Mickey. The opposition was not strong immediately. A few expressed concerns over the park's sprawl and the effects that it might have on the Manassas battlefield, which was less than five miles from the proposed site. The First Battle of Manassas, also referred to as the First Battle of Bull Run, was the first major battle of the Civil War. The Second Battle of Manassas on the same ground was of an even larger scale and another significant victory for the Confederacy. In the early 90s, the federal government had stopped the development of a shopping mall near the battlefield by purchasing the land directly surrounding it. It was a controversial and expensive move, all done for the purpose of preserving the area's history. In the early 1990s, public interest for Civil War history was high thanks to Ken Burns' hit documentary miniseries, Civil War. The series was incredibly popular, and it turned many professors and historians into recognizable figures. David McCullough, the show's narrator, was now a familiar voice to millions, and he just so happened to be one of the first to raise that voice against Disney's invasion of Virginia. It is a commercial blitzkrieg by the Panzer Division of Developers, David McCullough, author and historian. Disney's surprise attack, which at first seemed to have been a successful mission, had significant drawbacks. For one, they lost valuable time that they could have spent building relationships with the community and lawmakers. The whiplash from the announcement was too severe to do this effectively afterwards. 
They could have also spent time recruiting historians before the plan for the park was announced, which would have reduced opposition from the academic community. Another mistake was that when they did finally reveal their intentions for the park, Imagineering revealed far too much, giving the opposition ammunition to use against Disney's America in the media. The headlines for Disney taking on the issue of slavery wrote themselves, and set the park back. While Disney was surprised by the opposition they had received so far, their morale was not broken, and they began recruiting a few historians of their own. Eric Foner, historian and professor at Columbia University, who had been working with Disney on the 1993 retooling of the Hall of Presidents, was asked to join the project. He agreed. James Horton, a historian and professor of African American history at George Washington University, was also asked to consult on the park. He was skeptical of Disney's ability to deliver on their concept, but he felt that he had an obligation to help. It seems unfair to me to say to Disney, this is terrible, you're doing this wrong then refuse them when they say, will you help us do it right? We need to try to make sure that they do it as well as we can push them to do it. James Oliver Horton, historian and professor. With only days left in Virginia's General Assembly session, Disney and Governor Allen demanded that a $163 million incentive package be passed through the state legislature. This included $131.5 million in road improvement bonds. The spending would result in the widening of the congested interstate near the park. Only $49 million of the project would fall on Disney, which would be paid by sales tax of at least $3.8 million annually. If the park did not produce that amount of tax in any given year, Disney would have to pay the difference. Still, the majority of the burden was placed on the taxpayers of Virginia, which concerned many of the legislators. Governor Allen reminded them that with or without Disney, I-66 would need to be improved. The traffic during rush hours was causing the highway to become dangerous. Many believed that the Disney park would only exacerbate these issues, but Allen pointed out that the tours would be coming in the early morning and leaving in the late night, avoiding the work rush. The legislature was still skeptical. Now mid-March, opposition to the park had become more prevalent in the months since the park was announced. Passionate editorials were being written in opposition to the park in papers across the country, demonstrators were showing up to events and development meetings, and more and more prominent historians were voicing their opinions on the project. Uninterested in their concerns, Disney threatened to pull the project out of Virginia if the incentives package was not approved immediately. The legislature granted the bonds, having little choice and no time for deliberation. Another win for the Walt Disney Company, but it did not help the public skepticism toward the project. Around this time, Eisner and Wells were able to restructure Euro Disney's finances, providing a sliver of hope to the desperate resort. Less than a month later on April 3, 1994, Frank Wells was killed in a helicopter crash at the age of 62. Wells had been integral to the company's success. He often took care of important deals and was a master of public relations. During their partnership, Eisner was able to get attached to pet projects, knowing that Wells would pick up any slack that the distraction caused. After Wells' death, Eisner was lost. Katzenberg demanded that he be promoted to Wells' position, but Eisner assumed the role of president himself while he searched for a replacement. Eisner placed a lot of pressure on himself following the death of Wells. While the studios were pumping out classics, the parks were in a state of disarray. Euro Disney was better, but still very much a disaster, and the opposition to the Virginia Park was just beginning. On May 11th, a coalition of historians, including David McCullough and many other prominent scholars, formed the organization Protect Historic America. Its one purpose was to stop Disney from building its Virginia theme park. Shelby Foote, a member of the organization and another historian featured in Ken Burns' Civil War docuseries, began doing newspaper and television interviews about his feelings toward the park. He argued that no one was against Disney the company, but they were against their plans. He claimed building the park so close to the Manassas battlefield would be careless, on top of the project as a whole doing little to educate the public about real history. Foote also had little confidence in general audiences, believing that, quote, people would rather go see the reenactment of Manassas than they would go to see Manassas. In other words, building a park about American history on top of historic ground was akin to building a theme park based on California in California. Another complaint made by the group was that the name Disney's America implied that Disney owned the country and its history. Eisner would later consider changing the name to Disney's American Celebration to appease critics. Hearing of the formation of Protect Historic America ahead of their announcement, Disney attempted to beat them to the punch. The company quickly donated $100,000 to the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Battle Sites, but the loud voice of the opposition overshadowed the gesture. For the first time, public opinion was shifting against Disney. Talk shows started broadcasting those that opposed Disney's America, 
Environmental groups began focusing on the effects the park could have on air quality, and a Senate subcommittee hearing was even scheduled to discuss the controversy. Disney was shocked by the strength and determination of the opposition, and Eisner, still recovering from the loss of Wells, was becoming increasingly unpredictable. On June 21, 1994, the Senate Public Lands and National Monument Subcommittee held a hearing with representatives on both sides of the Disney's America debate. Reporters and the public flocked Capitol Hill, expecting nothing less than the most exciting Senate Public Lands and National Monument Subcommittee hearing since its inception, and it did not disappoint. The hearing started out with a passionate speech by Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who argued that the entire hearing was a waste of time, and that the federal government should have no part in Disney's America, as it was clearly a state issue. He also provided his own opinion on the matter. Nobody wants a Coney Island in their backyard, but I doubt this is in the Disney plans. And as the American Indians once found out, just because you got there first does not mean you get to make all the decisions. Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. Campbell then slammed a Mickey Mouse hat on the table, ending his remarks. This was only 15 minutes into the five-hour hearing. Campbell's speech was followed by Senator Larry Craig, seemingly indifferent on Disney as a company but a staunch supporter of their right to build where the state allowed them. In a confusing, bordering on nonsensical rant, he made his case for the development of the park. Now if we were here debating whether Mickey would be wearing blue or gray as he interpreted for the visitors as his new theme park how the Battle of Manassas was waged, I would say that would be a worthy debate, because I don't know whether Mickey was a Confederate or whether he was a member of the Union forces but I am willing to allow Disney the opportunity, under proper local zoning and state authority, to make a determination of whether Mickey should be wearing blue or gray. Senator Larry Craig. Disney was off to a good start, receiving support from both Democratic and Republican senators. However, John Warner, a senator from Virginia, cast doubts on the long-term economic impact that the park would have on top of its ability to comply with federal mandates such as the recently passed Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act or Ice-T for short. Ice-T is said multiple times throughout the hearing. Still, Warner said he would reserve his final judgment until the local, state, and federal government had completed their reviews. The following speeches from the committee and its guests were either in support or indifferent on the issue, going in Disney's favor either way. The opposition of historians waited patiently for their turn to speak, listening to senator after senator question the necessity for the hearing and putting their support behind Virginia. This was until Senator John Chafee spoke. In a passionate speech, Chafee reflected the same sentiments as the concerned historians, arguing that the potential economic development of the area did not justify the destruction of historical landmarks. After his remarks, a few members of the audience began to cheer, and the chairman of the committee threatened to remove them if there were any more inappropriate reactions to the speakers. It was now time for Governor Allen to speak. Allen was well-spoken, and his overwhelming support for his people and Disney's project was impressive and persuasive. He also attempted to cast doubts on the motivation behind the project's opposition, suggesting that concerns over the loss of historical ground was a mere tactic used by wealthy Virginia landowners to halt progress. History is not just for professional historians and professors, and it's not just for smug, self-appointed arbiters of culture and Hollywood movie stars. It is for all our citizens, or it should be. And if this project will help stimulate a new generation to take interest in history, as I believe it will, then we ought to be applauding the effort. We would not be here today if opposition to this park had not become a crusade for some well-connected folks who didn't want it located within 30 miles of their neighborhood. George Allen, Governor of Virginia. After his remarks, Governor Allen got up to leave, but the chairman requested that he stay for a few minutes of questioning. He would then be cross-examined for 56 straight minutes. By the time the historians were given their chance to speak, it seemed that Disney had already won the battle. First up for the historian opposition was David McCullough. If one were to search for a surviving segment of historic America worth protecting, worth fighting for, worth keeping as it is for future generations, one could hardly do better. And by contrast, one could also hardly find a place less appropriate for a huge sprawling commercial development. David McCullough, author and historian. Following McCullough was James McPherson, a historian and the president of Protect Historic America. While these speeches were passionate and well-written, they seemed to do little to convince the senators. When questioned about what course of action they would prefer the federal government to take on the matter, the historians had no answer. The hearing concluded with Disney representatives giving their perspective on the park. Peter Rummel, Mark Pacala, and the director of real estate development, Dana Nottingham. Their speeches were redundant, expressing the same views made by many of the senators and experts. 
it was clear that the federal government would not be intervening on the development of Disney's America. It should be noted that a week before, Eisner had given many of the congressmen a private early screening of The Lion King. Demonstrators hearing of the premiere had shown up in costume with signs that read, Eisner is the Lion King. During these weeks in Washington, Eisner had given an aggressive interview for the Washington Post, where two defensive and ignorant quotes made their way into the headlines. I sat through many history classes where I read some of their stuff and I didn't learn anything. It was pretty boring. I'm shocked because I thought we were doing good. I expected to be taken around on people's shoulders. Disney might have won in Washington, but they were losing everywhere else. In the late summer of 1994, Eisner invited a group of historians to tour Walt Disney World in an attempt to court them into supporting the project, or at the very least, not opposing it. The first day of the tour, Eisner took the group through Epcot, making a stop at the American Pavilion and World Showcase where they watched the American Adventure show. Eisner, believing that this would prove Disney's dedication to history, was surprised when the group reacted negatively to the presentation. They believed that the show proved that the idea of building Disney's America was wrong, and that the company would not be able to tell an accurate contextual view of American history. Eisner quickly defended the park. I don't disagree with 98% of what has been said here, but I do want to point out that Disney's America won't be a 25-minute experience like the American Adventure. The story we're going to try to tell at the park will take eight hours to deliver. It's going to be made up of 15 or 20 different components. Each one will deal with a different aspect of the American experience. The next day, Eisner took the group to the Magic Kingdom. He brought them to Liberty Square to watch the Hall of Presidents. The historians had a much more positive reaction to the show, likely thanks to Eric Foner's reworking. This gave many of the historians confidence that Disney's America could work. I am convinced that the Disney project can complement historical Washington and prove that serious history can be every bit as fascinating as fantasy and even more compelling. James Oliver Horton, historian and consultant to Disney's America. After the positive response from the group, Eisner mentioned that the Imagineers had been considering scrapping the serious Ellis Island immigration show in favor of a comedy musical on immigration starring the Muppets. No responses or reactions were documented. While Eisner was doing his best to court historians, Protect Historic America and other organizations continued their campaign against Disney's America, gaining significant traction throughout the summer of 1994. They spent more on advertising campaigns and lobbying, including an ad in the New York Times attacking Eisner directly. The rhetoric toward Disney was becoming increasingly hostile, with no commentator holding back. Would we as a country want a theme park at Normandy Beach? Would we permit that? Would we, in the name of creating jobs, make splinters of Mount Vernon? If Disney were a country, it would be Israel. Their reputation is almost a burden. There are things they cannot do with impunity that other companies can. Margaret King, cultural historian. The state of Virginia, now slightly annoyed at the company for their aggressive tactics and unconcerned with turning them away, began conducting serious investigations of the park's impact to Prince William County and the surrounding area. In a major blow to Disney, an expert group of inspectors found that the park's sprawl would result in the destruction of 16 battlefields, 17 historic districts, and 10 towns. During this time, Disney was forced to spend more on lobbying, while the Imagineers were having a difficult time keeping the park within budget, which was one of the original selling points. Plus, Disney's research revealed that the park would be closed for four months in the winter instead of two or three as originally thought, decreasing the expected annual revenue of the park by around 10%. The company began to fear that Disney's America would become their next Euro Disney, and they were becoming increasingly worried at how the protests reflected the Disney brand. We continue to be dumbstruck that the critical pencils have been so sharpened before we've done anything. This is very early in the design process. We are not just Mickey Mouse animators. We are a much richer, more contextual company than that. Mark Bacala, General Manager of Disney's America. On Saturday, September 17, 1994, 3,000 activists, including Ralph Nader, took to the streets of Washington, D.C. to protest Disney's America. Chanting and displaying signs and artwork, the group of concerned Virginians and historians made their message clear. They were going to stop the invasion of Disney's empire. I have doubts on whether the technical wizardry that so entrances children and grown-ups at other Disney parks can do anything but mock a theme as momentous as slavery. To present even the most squalid sights would be to cheaply romanticize suffering. William Styron, novelist. The protesters even presented a petition on the steps of Capitol Hill, 
with 29,000 signatures in opposition to the park. At the exact same time that Virginia was invading Washington, Disney was parading through Virginia. Haymarket's annual parade displayed the opposite sentiment of the Washington protest, with the remaining supporters of the park coming out to see Disney characters and bringing signs and pins in support of Disney's America. The two marching armies were giving it their all, but the media reported that the opposition had won the day, and just over a week later, they would win the war. On September 28th, Disney announced that it would be withdrawing their plans for Disney's America from Virginia. The media had found out about the park's cancellation prior to the announcement and began reporting that Disney had been defeated. Governor Allen, who had not wavered in his support of the project, found out from the reports, and not from Disney directly. Haymarket Mayor Jack Capp raised the town hall's flag to half-staff in mourning of the park's cancellation. It was clear that while Disney might be able to physically construct the park, the negative sentiment towards it was not worth the effort. Plus, Disney believed that the opposition would find ways to delay and block certain aspects of the project, costing Disney time and money. They hoped that their concession to the protesters and to the historians would reduce any damage done to the Disney brand. We remain convinced that a park that celebrates America and an exploration of our heritage is a great idea, and we will continue to work to make it a reality. However, we recognize that there are those who have been concerned about the possible impact of our park on historic sites in this unique area and we have always tried to be sensitive to the issue. While we do not agree with all their concerns, we are seeking a new location so that we can move the process forward. After a long and hard-fought battle in Prince William County, Disney accepted their defeat. They relinquished the Exxon options in December and sold the remaining land in March of 1995. Eisner still wanted to build the park, and he continued to believe that Virginia was the best place for it. Disney attempted to lobby the opposition to support Disney's America in a different location, but few were interested. Disney briefly considered building the park in Pennsylvania, much to the delight of the state government. However, after protesters began handing out pamphlets at Gettysburg during Heritage Week, Disney gave up on Pennsylvania. In 1995, Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park, California was put up for sale by the Knott's family. Disney saw this as an opportunity to build Disney's America by utilizing the park's existing structures. But the Knott's family refused to sell to Disney out of fear that the company would change too much of the park. Walt Disney Imagineering had also created a new concept for a Virginia park using the name Disney's American Celebration, and focusing less on teaching history and more on entertainment. This park would have included pavilions similar to Epcot's Future World, with a heavy focus on shows and presentations of American ideals such as work, military, and family. This park concept seemed to die with the Virginia park. Disney's America was a huge blow to the Walt Disney Company, and the defeat and coinciding events had a huge impact on the temperament of Eisner for the remainder of his tenure. For many, it turned Disney from a company to be applauded to a company to be feared. The historians, Virginians, and nonprofits that had opposed the park pulled off a huge upset, driving the media giant out of their state for good. The land where the park would have sat is now occupied with tens of thousands of homes. The traffic issues on I-66 never improved, as the incentives plan was dropped with the park. Still, the cancellation of Disney's America was a victory for everyone involved in the opposition, and it left Disney to reflect on why they were defeated. Some speculated how Walt Disney himself would have handled the development of the park. I see Disney defending the park. They are defensive and not very forthcoming, which is really silly. I don't think Walt would have asked the people to just trust him. Walt would have explained. They are part of the fabric of our lives. It's time they acted that way. Carol Ann Marling, Professor of American Studies and Art History at the University of Minnesota. Cultural analyst Jamie O'Boyle believed that the hostility toward Disney's America was part of a larger national issue. To make his point, he recalled a rather exciting day at Disneyland. On August 6, 1970, the Young International Party, a political group of young anti-war, anti-establishment demonstrators, invaded Disneyland and took control of Tom Sawyer Island. They recognized Disneyland, correctly, as a metaphor for America. Disney is so closely tied in with the national psyche of who we are, the things we like about ourselves, that we don't like the idea there is a corporation behind it. As much as anything, this is about us. Jamie O'Boyle, Cultural Analyst. The synergetic relationship Walt Disney had created over 30 years before the war for Disney's America had festered, becoming a complicated mix of corporation and culture. If Disney's America was indicative of anything, it's that, in a lot of ways, Disney is America, and America is Disney. People want to celebrate both, for their power, glory, or magic, but are often uncomfortable with the ways in which they were obtained or produced. The hypocrisies are glaring if you look for them. How can a company claiming to care about history be willing to risk the destruction of historical landmarks? 
How can a country founded on freedom have such a long history of denying its citizens basic rights? It's problematic, controversial, and unresolved. But it doesn't erase the good done by either, and it doesn't disqualify them from improvement. The only thing that seems to be for certain is that it would be better if those complex issues were not tackled by an animatronic. The long-term impact that the Disney's America conflict had on the Walt Disney Company was minuscule compared to what it could have been, and the company learned valuable lessons from the failure. When Eisner began development on Animal Kingdom, he made sure to recruit environmental and zoological experts before the park was announced. The final pitch for Disney's America was a brief contender for Anaheim's second gate. This idea transformed into California Adventure, with the Lewis and Clark Expedition inspiring Grizzly River Run, Victory Field and its attractions inspiring Condor Flats, the State Fair area inspiring Paradise Pier, and the Family Farm Territory inspiring Bountiful Valley Farm. While Disney's America was dead and their resolve weakened, the Disney Empire marched on. Fueled by the success of their studios alone, Disney once again ventured outside of Anaheim and Orlando, looking to build a less expensive, less controversial experience. This time, however, they weren't focused on just one city. Eisner and the Disney Empire were going after complete domination. It's marching on. Oh, <laughs> 